All right, here we are on chapter four, the visit to grandmother. The next morning, the sun came out early as bright as ever, and then Peter appeared with the goats, and again the two children climbed up together to the high meadows, and so it went on day after day till Heidi, passing her life thus among the grass and flowers, was burnt brown with the sun and grew so strong and healthy that nothing ever ailed her. She was happy, too, and lived from day to day as free and light-hearted as the little birds that make their home among the green forest trees. Then the autumn came, and the wind blew louder and stronger, and the grandfather would say sometimes, Today you must stay at home, Heidi. A sudden gust of the wind would blow a little thing like you over the rocks into the valley below in a moment. Whenever Peter heard that he must go alone, he looked very unhappy, for he saw nothing but mishaps of all kinds ahead and did not know how he should bear the long, dull day without Heidi. Then, too, there was the good meal he would miss, and besides that, the goats on these days were so naughty and obstinate that he had twice the usual trouble with them, for they had grown so accustomed to Heidi's presence that they would run in every direction and refuse to go on unless she was with them. Heidi was never unhappy, for wherever she was found, for, for wherever she was, she found something to interest or amuse her. She liked best, it is true, to go out with Peter up to the flowers and the great bird where there was so much to be seen and so many experiences to go through among the goats with their different characters. But she also found her grandfather's hammering and sawing and carpentering very entertaining. And if it should chance to be the day when the large round goat's milk cheese was made, she enjoyed beyond measure looking on at this wonderful performance and watching her grandfather as with sleeves rolled back, he stirred the great cauldron with his bare arms. The thing which attracted her most, however, was the waving and roaring of the three old fir trees on these windy days. She would run away repeatedly from whatever she might be doing to listen to them, for nothing seemed so strange and wonderful to her as the deep, mysterious sound in the tops of the trees. She would stand underneath them and look up, unable to tear herself away, looking and listening while they bowed and swayed and roared as the mighty wind rushed through them. There was no longer now the warm, bright sun that had shone all through the summer. So Heidi went to the cupboard and got out her shoes and stockings and dress, for it was growing colder every day. And when Heidi stood under the fir trees, the wind blew through her as if she was a thin little leaf. But still, she felt she could not stay indoors when she heard the branches moving and waving outside. Then it grew very cold and Peter would come up early in the morning, blowing on his fingers to keep them warm. But he soon left off coming, for one night there was a heavy fall of snow, and the next morning the whole mountain was covered with it, and not a single little green leaf was to be seen anywhere upon it. There was no Peter that day, and Heidi stood at the little window, looking out in wonderment, for the snow was beginning again, and the thick flakes kept falling till the snow was up to the window, and still they continued to fall, and the snow grew higher, so that at last the window could not be opened, and she and her grandfather were shut up fast within the hut. Heidi thought this was great fun and ran from one window to the other to see what would happen next and whether the snow was going to cover up the whole hut so that they would have to light a lamp, although it was broad daylight. But things did not get as bad as that, and the next day, the snow having ceased, the grandfather went out and shoveled away the snow around the house and threw it into such great heaps that they looked like mountains standing at intervals on either side of the hut. And now the windows and door could be opened, and it was well it was, for as Heidi and her grandfather were sitting one afternoon on their three-legged stools before the fire, there came a great thump at the door, followed by several others, and then the door opened. It was Peter, who had made all that noise, knocking the snow off his shoes. He was still white all over for he had had to fight his way through deep snowdrifts and large lumps of snow that had frozen upon him till clung to his clothes, still clung to his clothes. He had been determined, however, not to be beaten and to climb up to the hut, for it was a week now since he had seen Heidi. 
Good evening, he said as he came in. Then he went and placed himself as near the fire as he could without saying another word. But his whole face was beaming with pleasure at finding himself there. Heidi looked on in, astonish in astonishment, for Peter was beginning to thaw all over with the warmth so that he had the appearance of a trickling waterfall. Well, General, and how goes it with you, said the grandfather. Now that you have lost your army, will you will have to turn to your pen and pencil. Why must he turn to his pen and pencil, asked Heidi immediately, full of curiosity. During the winter, he must go to school, explained, explained grandfather, and learn how to read and write. It's a bit hard, although useful sometimes afterwards. Am I not right, General? Yes, indeed, assented Peter. Heidi's interest was now thoroughly awakened, and she had so many questions to put to Peter about all that was to be done and seen and heard at school, and the conversation took so long that Peter had time to get thoroughly dry. Peter had always great difficulty in putting his thoughts into words, and he found his share of the talk doubly difficult today, for by the time he had an answer ready to one of Heidi's questions, she had already put two or three more to him, and generally, such as required a whole long sentence in reply. The grandfather sat without speaking during this conversation. Only now and then a twitch of amusement at the corners of his mouth showed that he was listening. Well now, General, you have been under fire for some time and must want some refreshment. Come and join us, he said at last. And as he spoke, he rose and went to fetch the supper out of the cupboard. And Heidi pushed the stools to the table. There was also now a bench fashioned, fastened against the wall, for as he was no longer alone, the grandfather had put up seats of various kinds here and there, long enough to hold two persons, for Heidi had a way of always keeping close to her grandfather, whether he was walking, sitting, or standing. So there was comfortable place for them all three, and Peter opened his round eyes very wide when he saw what a large piece of meat um, uncle gave him on his thick slice of bread. It was a long time since Peter had had anything so nice to eat. As soon as the pleasant meal was over, Peter began to get ready for returning home, for it was already growing dark. He had said his good night and his thanks, and was just going out when he heard, when he turned again and said, I shall come again next Sunday, this day week. And grandmother sent word that she would like you to come and, and see her one day. It was quite a new idea to Heidi that she should go and pay anybody a visit, and she could not get it out of her head. So the first thing she said to her grandfather the next day was, I must go down to see grandmother today. She will be expecting me. The snow is too deep, answered the grandfather, trying to put her off. But Heidi had made up her mind to go since the grandmother had sent her that message. She stuck to her intention, and not a day passed, but what in the course of it she said five or six times to her grandfather, I must certainly go today. The grandmother will be waiting for me. On the fourth day, when with every step one took, the ground crackled with frost, and the whole vast field of snow was hard as ice, Heidi was sitting on her high stool at dinner with the bright sun shining in upon her through the window, and again repeated her little speech. I must certainly go down to see the grandmother today, or else I shall keep her waiting too long. The grandfather rose from table, climbed up to the hayloft, and brought down the thick sack that was Heidi's coverlet, and said, Come along, then. The child skipped out gleefully after him into the glittering world of snow. The old fir trees were standing now quite silent, their branches covered with the white snow, and they looked so lovely as they glittered and sparkled in the sunlight that Heidi jumped for joy at the sight and kept on calling out, Come here! Come here, Grandfather! The fir trees are all silver and gold. The Grandfather had gone into the shed, and he now came out dragging a large hand sleigh along with him. Inside it was a low seat, and the sleigh could be, could be pushed forward and guided by the feet of the one who sat upon it with the help of a pole that was fastened to the side. After he had been taken round the fir trees by Heidi, that he might see their beauty from all sides, he got into the sleigh and lifted the child onto his lap. Then he wrapped her up in the sack that she might keep nice and warm, 
and the pole with his right hand and gave the sleigh a push forward with his two feet. The sleigh shot down the mountain side with such rapidity that Heidi thought they were flying through the air like a bird and shouted aloud with delight. Suddenly they came to a standstill and there they were at Peter's hut. Her grandfather lifted her out and unwrapped her. There you are, now go in, and when it begins to grow dark, you must start on your way back home. Then he left her and went up the mountain, pulling his sleigh after him. It's a lot of work. Heidi opened the door of the hut and stepped into a tiny room that looked very dark, with a fireplace and a few dishes on a wooden shelf. This was the little kitchen. She opened another door and now found herself in another small room, for the place was not a herdsman's hut like her grandfather's with one large room on the ground floor and a hayloft above, but a very old cottage where everything was narrow and poor and shabby. A table was close to the door, and as Heidi stepped in, she saw a woman sitting at it, putting a patch on a waistcoat, which Heidi recognized at once as Peter's. In the corner sat an old woman, bent with age, spinning Heidi was quite sure this was the grandmother, so she went up to the spinning wheel and said, Good day, grandmother. I have come at last. Did you think I was a long time coming? The woman raised her head and felt for the hand that the child held out to her, and when she found it, she passed her own over it thoughtfully for a few seconds, and then said, Are you the child who lives up with our uncle? Are you Heidi? Yes, yes, answered Heidi. I have just come down in the sleigh with grandfather. Is it possible? Why, your hands are quite warm. Brigitte, did Al Uncle come himself with the child? Peter's mother had left her work and risen from the table and now stood looking at Heidi with curiosity, scanning her from head to foot. I do not know, mother, whether Uncle came himself. It is hardly likely. The child probably makes a mistake. But Heidi looked steadily at the woman, not at all as if in any uncertainty, and said, Oh, I know quite well who wrapped me in my bed cover and brought me down in the sleigh. It was Grandfather. There was some truth then, perhaps, in what Peter used to tell us of our uncle during the summer, when he thought he must be wrong, when we thought he must be wrong, said Grandmother. But who would ever have believed that such a thing was possible? I did not think the child would live three weeks up there. What is she like, Brigitte? The latter had so thoroughly examined Heidi on all sides that she was well able to describe her to her mother. She was Adelaide. She has Adelaide's tenderness of figure, but her eyes are dark and her hair curly like her father's and the old man's up there. She takes after both of them, I think. Meanwhile, Heidi had not been idle. She had made the round of the room and looked carefully at everything there was to be seen. All of a sudden, she exclaimed, Grandmother, one of your shutters is flapping backwards and forwards. Grandfather would put a nail in it and make it all right in a minute, or else it will break one of the panes someday. Look, look, look how it keeps on banging. Oh, dear child, said the old woman, I am not able to see it, but I can hear that and many other things besides the shutter. Everything about this place rattles and creaks when the wind is blowing, and it gets inside through all the cracks and holes. The house is going to pieces, and in the night, when the two others are asleep, I often lie awake in fear and trembling, thinking that the whole place will be given away and fall and kill us. And there is not a creature to mend anything for us, for Peter does not understand such work. But why can you not see, Grandmother, that the shutter is loose? Look, there it goes again. See, that one there. And Heidi pointed to the particular sh shutter. Alas, child, it is not only that I cannot see, I can see nothing, nothing, said the Grandmother in a voice of hesitation. Oh, excuse me, in a voice of lamentation. So she's kind of sad about the fact that she can't see but if I were to go outside and put back the shutter so that you have more light, then you could see, Grandmother? Oh, no, no, not even then. Not one can make it light for me again. Not one. But if you were to go outside among all the white snow, then surely you would find it light. Just come with me, Grandmother, and I will show you. Heidi took hold of the old woman's hand to lead her along, for she was beginning to feel quite distressed at the thought of her being without light. Let me be, dear child. It is always dark for me now. 
whether in sun or snow, no light can penetrate my eyes. All right, friends, we're going to stop right there and we'll pick up at, for this last half of chapter four tomorrow. See you then.